All right, can you guys hear me at the back of the room there? All right, cool. Everybody doing, doing well? Bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, caffeinated, hungover? Sorry. Uh, yeah, so just, just wanted to welcome you to the last day of Ignite. Hopefully you guys have had uh, a lot of learning and a lot of feedback for us uh, as well. My name is Saurabh Pradhan. I'm one of the product managers uh, at Palo Alto Networks. My primary area of focus is Panorama. How many of you know what Panorama is? Okay, good, that's a good start. Um, how many of you manage more than 10 firewalls on it? Good, that's another good sign. You guys have been buying quite a bit from us, which is, which is always a good sign. Um, the intent for, for, the, for the presentation when we were coming up with this was, let's, let's go through and, and sort of, give, given that we have a wide variety of, uh, of, of customers here, uh, customers who are just starting out uh, all the way to, to expert level folks who, who ask really, really difficult questions, I'm gonna try and build out every, uh, every step uh, into, into, into sort of multiple uh, basics to a little bit of medium stuff, then into the advanced. And we'll keep, I'm, I'm hoping to keep a little bit of time for, for question and answers. If we can't get to question and answers uh, to, to, uh, to, to fulfill your heart, I'm down in the booth, uh, the Panorama booth, starting at 10.30 all the way to noon. We've got coverage through and through. Um, please feel, to, feel free to stop by and, and um, we can discuss further. We can probably do a demo or other things as well. So let's get into it. <clears throat> How many of us in this room have run into a situation where things are static in your environment? Nothing changes, right? So overall, what we've seen is a whole bunch of customers either get into new projects because their, their companies are, are deploying new, uh, new technologies, moving to the cloud, um, expanding either through acquisition or just expanding, which is a good sign. What that results in for all of us, all of us meaning uh, people like us who, who are network practitioners, is you're asked to go secure that thing, which implies configuration changes, which implies now you need to go change a whole bunch of stuff on your network, stabilize it, keep it at the ready, keep it in top, tip top shape, and then if things break, guess who gets to fix it, right? So overall, that is the story of our lives. What I plan to do is to sort of take this, break it open a little bit, and share some of my, my learnings from you with the others in you. So take, uh, take examples of certain customers, see how they've deployed, bring it out, um, and, and share that with the rest of you. That's, that's sort of the plan um, uh, for, for, for me to go by. Additionally, I will look to give you a little bit of insight into 8.1 and the, uh, the, the, the features and why those features are, are important, how best to use them, et cetera. So let's get started with the first piece, which is basically creating an auditing configuration. How many of us actually end up touching Panorama on a daily basis, right? How many of us are running Panorama 8.0, just a quick show of hands? Holy crap, okay. Um, that's good. How many of us are brave enough to go to 8.1? Okay. Um, meet me afterwards, I'll buy you drinks, but that's, that's after the fact. Um, anyway, talking about uh, creating config, creating um, and, and auditing config, I think one of the key tenets of Panorama in general and the, and the philosophy by which we go is config reusability. And the reason reusability of config is important is, A, it gives you consistency. And consistency, not necessarily from a point of view of looking at, um, looking at config and saying, oh, is this consistent to the T? No, consistency from a point of view of looking at config and saying, hey, this is inconsistent. I need to go fix it, right? So reusing policy, reusing objects, everything is the same. Something is amiss, you know that it is amiss. The second one is operational efficiency. With reuse, or, or with, with the ability to, to reuse config, when you want to go 
from, um, from, from one device to five devices or 10 devices, you attach them to the same configuration. So that's where efficiency comes into play. The third one is repeatability. Repeatability, in general, gives you the ability to say, I've got config in one branch or one data center. I want to migrate and move it to 20 branches and five data centers. It's easy. And the last piece is flexibility, right? Flexibility from a point of view of keeping that config the same, but in places where you need different, uh, the, the config needs to work on different IP addresses, or it needs to work on uh, different security profiles. Yeah, keep the config the same, just swap out the values on the object. That is the flexibility that we're talking about. So those are, that is sort of the philosophy that we come by when we are talking about config management in Panorama, or through Panorama. We all understand that while our config is simple and straightforward, there are always managed inconsistencies. And by managed inconsistencies, I mean you know that this firewall or this area is going to be different. It is different by design, right? Whereas there are some people who don't want to follow process. How many of those do we have in this room who still manage their config locally on the firewall and have no idea about the auditing of that firewall config? Anybody? Wow, now nobody wants to raise their hand. Huh? All right, you guys are then doing a great job. Because I've seen customers who have no idea what is in their config. They've got 20 firewalls that they're managing. They're happily managing them independently. And when you ask them, okay, do you know that this firewall does not contain that config? Oh, that cannot be possible. Okay, live with it then. How, do, how did your network go down the last time around? Anyway, talking about configuration and what do we have in terms of constructs to manage that configuration? How many of us in this room use device groups or device group hierarchy? Great. Templates, template stacks? How many of you have run into issues with template stacks? There you go. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a second. But nonetheless, device groups are, for those of us who are, who are new to Panorama, Device groups are, are constructs of, of configuration that, are, uh, that, that manage the security aspect, which is the policies and objects um, in, in, our, in our configuration. The templates are, 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 are basically constructs that manage our uh, network and de uh, device, or sorry, network and device configuration, meaning the firewall, HA, uh, admins, admin roles, that, that type of configuration, right? Device group hierarchy, given that most of us do know about it, just, just to reiterate, device groups are, uh, are, are, are where we create the configuration, associate uh, firewalls or vSys uh, to, uh, to, to that uh, configuration. And then they can be arranged in a hierarchy. I mean, straight up, it's a, it's a hierarchy that looks pretty much something, something like this. What are some of the sort of items and entities that are interesting from a device group hierarchy point of view. There are three basic things that I would say. One, it is, uh, it, it, its fundamental thing is inheritance of, of object configuration, meaning any configuration that you create up top, the higher up you create that configuration, there's going to be inherited across that entire hierarchy, both for rules and for objects. They behave slightly differently, we'll, we'll get there, but that is, that is sort of the, uh, the, the primary um, function. The next question then becomes, how do I associate, or how do I create the hierarchy? So there are, there are multiple ways, and there is, there is ultimate flexibility with regards to you being able to create that hierarchy and, and managing it. But the way I've, I would define it is create the hierarchy in such a way that the configuration that you have that is most reusable goes high, high up top in that, uh, in that hierarchy. Now you might say, okay, what does that mean? Well, in certain cases, for example, if I'm a, a business unit-based organization, I might create a hierarchy that includes or that, that, that starts with my, um, with, with my, with my biz, business unit structure then further breaks into functional. Functional is, say, data center and branches, and then further into location, whether it be the US, ME, or, or, or APAC, or, or what have, whatever you have. The intent behind doing that is role-based access control being one. Each of these uh, 
each of these subtrees, in a way, can be, uh, can, be, can be carved out into access domains that you can hand off to somebody else if you, uh, if you, if you really wanted to. The other piece is tying the, um, tying the uh, device group hierarchy back to your organizational structure also improves the, uh, in a way, improves, improves the budgeting and how are you going to lay it out, your plans, et cetera. One thing that I will say, though, is you could go location and then functional, especially if you have a lot of variance in your configuration at, the, uh, at, at each one of the functional areas. So again, I know I'm not giving you a good answer on what is the best practice, but the best practice is make sure you have most of your configuration that is common or reusable up top, higher up in the hierarchy, and, and then, then it trickles down so that you're reusing that configuration. The second part to this is hierarchies are important from slow rolling configuration. How many of us have used um, device group hierarchies for slow rolling configuration? Uh, meaning, I start out in the small corner of my uh, deployment and then sort of want to expand that um, into, into a larger uh, deployment. Anybody used, uh, used, used the device group hierarchy for, for that? OK, cool. At least you have a couple of hands over there. So say, for example, my boss uh, asks me to to take an application, and, uh, or that is the application. So in this case, Slack is an application that, that, that I'm going to go deploy into my network. And he says, OK, go figure out what you need to do for this. You can come up with whatever security policies, objects, whatever else you require in terms of configuration, assign it in, or test it out in a small part of your network. So it is almost like a proof of concept in production. Once you have settled down on that configuration, you can just move it up top into the, into the branches uh, device group. In this case, bra uh, branches, because it manages multiple things, it automatically gets inherited by the rest of the, uh, rest of the, uh, the, the, the sub device groups. So in this case, I actually tested out my configuration in a specific location, brought it back up. Um, quick question, how many of you know that there is the ability for us to move configuration? policies and objects across device groups and device group hierarchies. OK, for those, who, those of you who did not know, multi-select the objects, take them, move them up. I mean, it's, it's straight, straight up. It's, it's right at the bottom toolbar uh, for, for you to do this. Right? So that's, that's as far as slow rolling configuration. So another, um, another way to, to sort of think about that. In terms of evaluation of rules, and this is, this is where some, some of the um, some of the interesting sides uh, of, of, uh, of, of, the, of the matter come into play. Pre-rules and post-rules. How many of us here use pre-rules? Fair number. Post-rules? All right. So pre-rules are and, and post-rules are both relevant from a, um, or related to how they are positioned in, uh, in, in reference to the local config on the firewall, right? Local rules on the firewall. Um, the pre-rules go top down uh, the, uh, in, in, in descending order of the hierarchy. Post rules are bottoms up from, uh, from, from, the, from the leaf uh, device group all the way back up out to shared. The best practice associated with using pre-rules is to do positive enforcement of certain things. So say, for example, you did not want peer-to-peer -peer traffic in your network, or you did not want, or want or, uh, any parked, uh, uh, parked URL categories or malicious or malware URL categories uh, ever on your network, which is, which is, which is fairly common sense, um, you would probably put those into pre-rules. Post rules are probably going to be your cleanup rules uh, for the most part. Or I've, used, I've seen customers use them where the connectivity into Panorama is, is probably not the best. So somewhere in, uh, in, in West Africa or Asia, where your links into, the, into Panorama are, are probably not the best, that's where I've seen customers used, use post rules. Now, post rules also leaves you open to writing local config on that firewall. Now, make sure that you control who gets to write that local config. Otherwise, you're going to end up in that situation where we talked about um, the, the, the config being all out of hand. Local admins go into the firewall, create a rule, and, and you forget about it. Yeah, there are ways and means for us to import that configuration in. But from an auditing point of view, that is, that is a pain in the neck. Objects, on the other hand, sort of behave a little bit differently. 
And this is where some of the flexibility and, um, and, and operational uh, efficiency side of things comes into play, right? Uh, in, in terms of how objects behave, it's, it's almost similar to uh, how AD group policies uh, sort of work. So you can either inherit the object uh, as is, the object's value as is, from the parent device group, or you can choose to override, or, or choose not to override that object, uh, it's, it's up to you, uh, to, to have a different value and a different meaning for the rule that, uh, that, uh, where that object is created. So say, for example, I'm going to have three separate rules that I've created. One is for a web application that is, that is located at that IP address. I've got file shares that I've, look, uh, that I've set up in, uh, in, in two of my uh, regional headquarters. And then I've got print servers that I want to have access to uh, that have different values altogether at each signal location. Now, if I wanted to, I can do three things. I can either go create the rules individually at each device group, and then um, sort of next time I want to add a service or change an IP address, I'm, I, or, or change, change the definition of that rule or match criteria for that rule, go through the pain of updating that rule across all of those, um, uh, the, those, those uh, uh, all of those East, US East, US West, Western Europe, and Central Europe um, device groups. Or I can write the configuration straight up into the, uh, into the root, DG word in this case, and then have specific do not override signals or si uh, markings on that object so that the value of that object, as it trickles down, cannot be overridden by any other admin that is local uh, uh, or that, is, that, is, uh, that, that manages, say, the US or the Europe uh, device groups. Any, has anybody used or not used um, the uh, overriding feature uh, for, for de uh, device group hierarchy? Used it? All right, cool. So ultimately, what you get out of it is you can maintain values as, um, as, as either defaults and override them going down the hierarchy. Or you can keep a value and say, this value is what I want to keep throughout my uh, deployment. And that is how you would keep, uh, keep the, uh, or, or that, that is when you would use the do not override feature, right? Network and uh, or networking configuration um, with templates and template stacks Basically, templates are another construct that, that, is, that is used to manage our device group, uh, sorry, manage our device and network config. We've seen a lot of, or a lot of you raised your hand when you said, oh, how many of us use, um, use, use templates and template stacks? Uh, template stacks are an ordered collection of templates, so it's, it's basically a top-down view of up to eight templates now with 8.1. And for, um, for, for those of you who are using templates in 8.0, when you go to 8.1, there is a fundamental change that you will see uh, with 8.1, giving you more reusability of that config as we, as, as, we go, uh, as we will discuss shortly. One other change for, uh, for, for those of you who are using template stacks or templates in 8.0, which have devices associated with them, 8.1 basically allows you to associate devices only to template stacks and not to templates. So just, we'll, we'll take care of the migration when you do the upgrade, but you'll start seeing a whole bunch of template stacks and devices associated with them, rather than having direct association between those templates. And the reason for it is, is sort of twofold, or there are two problems that we're looking to solve with this. What we've seen and what you guys have told us is, yeah, templates are great, but Templates don't give me the ability to change the IP address, uh, for, or for every single IP address that changes, even though the config is the same, I need to go now instantiate a new, uh, a new template or template stack. Or the second part that we've seen is I, I just have one extra static route on a, on a virtual router for five of these 30 devices. Are you, are, are you serious that I need to go build this whole thing all over again for just, just that one, um, uh, one, one virtual router? So there's a small um, sort of configuration uh, capability that I need to reuse, uh, but I can't because, uh, because, because the configuration is, is sort of different. Fundamentally, what this lead, leads to is a template or template stack per device 
which then results in redundant and bloated config. And then somebody is going to forget to add a zone or, or update the IP address somewhere else across those 30, 35, 40, 50 devices, which then results in errors and network outages. So we want to avoid all of that. There are two things that we've changed, or two fundamental things that we've changed uh, on, in the way templates and template st stacks work in 8.0. The first one is any place where we actually use IP addresses, FQDNs, HA group ID, ranges. And in the Ike gateway configuration specifically, the Ethernet address on which that Ike gateway is going to be built, those can all be variables. So let's take an example. I've got three branches over there whose ETH11 address is different. The way I can manage it today in 8.0 is basically come out and create three separate templates because those Interface IPs are different. The moment I say interface IPs are different, and I need to have three different uh, templates for it, I cannot reuse any of the other configuration. I need to go recreate that configuration three times over. right? Now, with 8.1, what you can do is where you're setting the value for that ETH11 IP address, and I'm taking the IP address as an example. You can do this with virtual routers. You can do this with. Um, Syslog servers, we, we, can, we can go through examples for this. Any place where you have that IP address that is differing, you can go to manage devices and say, for this specific device, this is the value that I want you to use in this template stack against this variable. So and it's, I, I know I said a lot of things there. Basically, you're setting a per device value against the variable that you have defined in the template itself. And for those of you who, who sort of are still trying to wrap your head around this, come by the booth. I can show you a demo of how this thing looks like. I do not want to take the risk of going through and fumbling with Wi-Fi over here. But nonetheless, um, what this also means is if you have a whole bulk of change or, or, bulk, uh, or, or changes in bulk, what you can do is import a CSV that contains all the variables against values for each device as a, as a table, import that back into Panorama, Panorama does the translation and pushes that configuration down to the devices. No need to update your firewalls. This is a Panorama-only function. So all of, all of you who've, who've been brave enough to update to 8.0, oh, sorry, 8.1, this is something that is available to you today in case you wanted to expand your template or uh, in, 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 uh, in, if you wanted to expand your template utilization. The second set of things is to do with cross-referencing configuration and making templates truly reusable in, in 8.0, or oh, sorry, in 8.1. One of the challenges that we have is with 8.0, you, you need to have the entire template be syntactically and semantically valid. When you commit, the configuration cannot have any errors on the template, right? That is, that is, that is, that is how we uh, sort of that is, that is the current behavior. With 8.1, the templates can have partial configuration. And what I mean by that is, if you created an admin uh, today with 8.0, you need to have the admin role in the same template and have it referenced before the, the configuration is committable. With 8.1, that is not true. You can just create an admin. So your admin roles can be in a different template. Admins can be in a different template. You're bringing all of that into the same template stack. And in the template stack, you're actually uh, combining all of these things. So th think of it this way. Whoa. Thank you. All right. So think of it this way. Um, the, oh, by the way, the other thing that we are allowing you to do with 8.1 is writing config natively on the template stack itself. Meaning, today, I, I, if, I, if I just create, uh, say, Let's, let's take an example of, uh, I don't know, uh, say zones, right? I, I've got five devices that need a special zone, and the remaining 25 just need the standard internal and external zones. I can create the zones on the template itself and then have that be inherited into the template stack and create a separate template stack for those five devices where the templates are still inherited, but I can write configuration against just, that, uh, just those five devices. 
So all of the reusability aspects of it are still maintained for you. Virtual routers, classic example. I've got one, uh, one set of firewalls where just a single uh, ISP link exists uh, into my branches. Some have dual links. How do I manage that? So think there, there are multiple ways or multiple instances where this becomes useful. Let's take another example where, um, where, and see how we can reuse this. So if I want to create, I've got a whole bunch of templates that I've already created. Some are functional, some are, uh, some are regional. Now, if I wanted to go create an EMEA perimeter stack, what does this mean? This means that I need to take the regional templates, obviously. It is a perimeter um, configuration, which means, or perimeter firewalls, which means I need to take the perimeter zones or the functional uh, uh, elements associated with it. And then I've, I need the supporting cast. So I need my HA config. By the way, HA config could not be managed through Panorama before this. So that's another bonus for you guys. Um, I need logging. I need the ability to, to set my global uh, configuration, so message of the day, my management IPs. I, I, I maybe need NTP servers that are regional or whatever it is. All of that configuration can go into that template stack. You would then, um, then, then connect all the, con all the configuration together. Places where you need different IP addresses, you can use variables. So the horizontal scaling of all the firewalls that are in the MEI parameter that require this configuration can be managed fundamentally through a single stack. Right? Similarly, now if I wanted to create the America's uh, data center stack, I would still get all of the relevant information. Maybe my routing is different. Yeah, great. Go through and update just the routing in that configuration or in that in that stacks um, in that stacks con context. Bring in the other stuff, put it all together, and off you go. So tomorrow, if 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 somebody comes in and says, "Hey, I need to add a separate zone to all my data centers," yeah, you just need to update it once. You don't need to go to twenty different device, uh, uh, twenty different templates, and update it. This is the only place that you need to do. Uh, uh, need to go update it, right? OK, we talked a lot about creating and managing consistent configuration, et cetera. Let's walk through the remaining life cycle of operationalizing those changes. And when I say operationalizing, um, how do I commit? How do I audit? Those, those sort of um, things. All of us can probably relate to this. There is a change request or ticket that comes in. It can be because of a variety of things. Uh, you've got operational, daily operational changes. It, it's because of troubleshooting. It's because of a customer request, whatever it is. Nonetheless, that change fundamentally results in a config, uh, a config change in the candidate config. So candidate config is what, we, what is the in-memory configuration. Basically, it is where all your changes are accumulated prior to you committing that into, uh, into, into Panorama. And those changes could come through either the API, UI, CLI, doesn't matter. We do not store multiple candidate config configurations. It is just a single candidate config that we have where all of those changes would go, uh, go in and lie. From there, you can select what changes you actually want to commit. That becomes your commit scope. And we'll, we'll talk about commit scopes and, and other things, how, you, how the admin-based uh, commits, et cetera, in 8.0 sort of overlay on top of this. But once you've selected what configuration is of interest to you to commit, you actually have the ability to either redo that configuration, meaning remove it from, from, the, uh, from, the, from the commit scope, redo that. You can audit it, run a diff, or, uh, or, or figure out what exactly are you committing, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through each one of these steps. Validation, uh, this, was a, uh, this, is, this is where you can either push, it from, uh, push that uh, commit scope from Panorama down to the firewalls and make sure nothing is going to break on the firewalls in terms of uh, commit failures. Or if you're going to start seeing app uh, warnings, or, or if, you, if you're going to see something different, you're going to know about it right then and there when you do the validate. Or if you feel that those changes are totally bogus, you can say, oh, I want to remove these changes. So I can say, in this case, I don't want any changes in device group one made by admin, admin five. right? And you can just revert, revert those changes um, out, of, out of the candidate config or out of the commit scope. Lastly, that change, the commit scope, as it goes into Panorama, you can further choose which devices you want to push that config to. You guys are all familiar with this. That becomes your push scope. You choose the devices. You choose the device groups and templates that you want uh, configuration from which to, uh, to be pushed there. And um, 
that is your entire life cycle of how the change actually goes through, goes through the system. Across all of this, whether it be each one of these elements, you're going to get role-based access control. So you can choose which uh, admins can actually go through and commit, or which admins can actually just create the configuration, which admins can actually do the, uh, do the push. Force template values, how many of us have run into issues with force template values here? All right, not too many people. Not too many people have been brave to check that box. All right, um, so that you can actually control which admins get access to force template values even, right? So there are, there are a whole bunch of things that you can do there. That results in who gets access to what. Config audit is config audit. Uh, show me the diff between version 5 and version 7. There is an interesting feature called commit description. How many of us use commit description today? Not too many. Please start using that one. The reason is because all of those commit descriptions, and I'll talk about it in just a second, all of those commit descriptions are searchable. You can actually use those in, uh, and you'll start seeing those in system logs, as well as the, uh, the, the commits are searchable. In, uh, in, in global find as well, right? So let's sort of walk through deploying these changes. And most of the, this is, this is our daily, daily lives, right? I mean, you, you, we, we, we sort of go through doing commits into Panorama and pushing to the firewalls on a daily basis. That's where most of our work uh, is. The granularity associated with admin-based commits was introduced in 8.0. You can basically select which admin uh, which admins changes you want to commit. And you can cross that with what locations you want those changes uh, to, to actually show up, uh, show up for. Meaning, if I made changes to device group one, template one, device group two, and template two, and another admin made the same changes in those same device groups, instead of you sending down all of the changes, which is what the behavior was in 7.1, you can now say, I just want Saurabh's changes, and I want those only for device group one. Right? This is an 8.0 feature. I'm sure you guys are using this one. The other piece there is where I've written ticket numbers or summary of configuration uh, changes that you're committing. That is your commit description. Please, please, please start using that one. I was trying to, get to, uh, I was trying to make this a mandatory field. There are, there are certain restrictions why I can't. But please start using that one, because that is what is going to give you the ability to go back and audit what, what actually went into the running config or to the devices. So this is, this is both on the push as well as on the, on the commit dialog that you'll see this. So you can actually track what ticket numbers went in what commit, what job ID, what, uh, what config version contained those changes. So all of that is, it becomes very interesting and is also available on the config audit um, uh, dialog over there. With 8.0, we've also introduced the ability for you not to require separate panorama commits and, um, and, and uh, push, push to devices. How many of us have been customers uh, pre-8.0? Uh, pre How many of you ran into issues where panorama vanished right after you did a device group commit and you had not committed panorama configuration? How was the merging experience? Not good? Yeah. So that will not happen to you in 8.0. The reason is because all of the configuration through the commit scope, through everything else, goes first into running. And we always push configuration from the running config. We never, ever push configuration from candidate uh, anymore. So for those of you who did not know this, that is how it works. So when you do a device group or a template commit, we are going to take configuration and push it down from the, from the running config, no more from the, uh, from the candidate config. So in summary, let's, let's sort of go back to our, so we created the configuration. We sort of now made the changes, committed the changes. What are the tools available for you from an audit point of view? The first one is config audit. I mean, on the, uh, on the panorama tab, you go through, you've got config audit right there. Select uh, the, the two versions, and we are going to show you the diff associated with this. There were some changes that were made in this area. But uh, most of those are back-end related changes anyways. The second one is global find. With global find, prior to this, uh, you could put in just configuration elements, and we would search through config and give you references. With 8.0 uh, or 8.1, I don't, I don't remember, uh, what you can do 
is actually put in either the admin name or the commit description, and we will find what the commit was, and we'll give you a little summary that says, or the, the, the uh, literal output of, of, the, of the little dialogue that comes up when you do the commit to show you wh whether it was successful, whether it was not successful, uh, what actually that commit carried into the, um, in, into the configuration, et cetera. Next is preview changes. Um, with 8.0, when you were looking to summer, uh, looking at a summary of changes that were going in your commit scope, we would actually show you a line by line listing of every single object that, uh, that, that was being carried in that commit. We have enhanced that capability to actually show you a per object diff. So if you, uh, for example, were, were, uh, were, were looking at a rule, now you can see bit on that specific rule what has changed right there in your preview changes when you're looking to commit that rule. Next, we talked about commit description, and we talked about it enough. Um, it, get, as I said, gets carried into your system logs. So you can search system logs by that ticket number or by, that, uh, by, by, by any other description that you have, and the admin or the device group, and see all the changes associated with it. With 8.0, we also indexed all of the expats um, on the config logs. How many of you actually use uh, the, the expats on the config logs to figure out what has changed in a specific device group between commits. Anybody? I, I knew you would. Uh, thanks, Scott. All right. 8.1 also introduces other capabilities for you to clean up config. And cl by clean up config, I mean it is mostly to do with keeping a better security posture um, in, in terms of your, um, in, in terms of removing rules that have not been used. So we have introduced a new rule usage feature. Besides your static hit count, and it's not static, we don't make stuff up, but uh, without, without in, in addition to giving you the hit count of the use, uh, of the rule, we also give you a per firewall view of when that rule was used first, and when was the last time that rule was hit, right? What this will do for you is to actually either look, uh, look up a rule and figure out if it was used in, uh, in, in across all the firewalls in that uh, rule base, or on a per firewall basis, what are the rules that are used, and then highlight the unused rules to actually um, remove them or disable them for a little bit. This is not dependent on logging. This is not dependent on um, on, on on any of the um, any of the reboots or, or any of those things. This is a straight up counter that the firewall sends to Panorama, and we, we maintain that data and show you that data uh, natively. This does require your PanOS firewall or your firewalls to be running PanOS 8.1 though, right? Two, while I'm showing this for security rules, this is available across all rule bases. So something, something for us to, to keep at the back of our mind. In terms of the um, UI export of the configuration, auditors come in and ask us for, hey, um, can you give me access to this, uh, uh, to, to this firewall because I want to go audit changes? Well, you can just give them a printout of the CSV or, or PDF, in, in CSV or PDF format for every single table that we have in the UI. Right? So whether it be the objects, whether it be the rules page, so be it. Two things to remember. One is I will give you a table of what you see, meaning if you filter that list, you'll get a filter, uh, output of the filtered list. Two, I will not give you references for, so I will not, I will not open up the references on, on the rule, for example. So in this case, if you have a, um, a, a, an address group that you're referencing, it'll just show up as the address group. You might have to, um, do more things in terms of getting uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the other uh, elements over here, uh, or sorry, the references over here. Let's get into sort of, now that we've looked at configuration for the most part, let's get into device monitoring and updates and, and see how, um, how, how best to keep your network in tip-top shape, right? All of us know how to deploy content through, uh, through Panorama fairly. Everybody knows how to deploy content through Panorama, and you've got a schedule on Panorama, you can deploy it. If your firewalls are directly connecting to the internet to pull down those, uh, those updates, yeah, use, use templates. That is the place where you would be able to set uh, your, your schedules, et cetera. 
Four things that Panorama does uh, from, a, uh, from, a, from a deployment perspective. Um, one is scheduled, obviously I, uh, I can schedule content updates, I can push software updates, and I can uh, also go collect licenses and deploy those licenses um, for, for the firewalls that Panorama manages. 8.1, or sorry, 8.0, one thing that has changed is Panorama no longer sits in the middle and shovel uh, bits and bytes to the firewalls it manages. If the firewalls are running 8.0, the firewalls are gonna come back to Panorama and pull, con uh, pull, uh, pull content from it, which means there are some network changes that you might have to do because there is an inbound connection into Panorama on port 28443. It is all documented. Nonetheless, if you're using NAT or the firewalls are coming over NAT, there, is, there, there are some considerations for you to take, uh, take a look at. The second part is in, yes, 80. If the firewalls are running 80. The second part is, um, is with 8.1, you've got a, the ability to revert content from Panorama. You've got the ability to set thresholds on Panorama schedule, same as what you can do on the firewalls. And th uh, three, you can now set different uh, uh, thresholds for new applications coming in, in, in through content uh, with, with 8.1. The other feature that we're talking about in Panorama is the ability for us to track and baseline performance monitoring within Panorama itself for the managed firewalls, right? So as we deploy a new configuration, as things change on your network, the baseline performance in terms of your CPU utilization, data plane, um, um, sorry, uh, management plane, memory utilization, the number of sessions, the throughput, the global session utilization, packet buffers, you name it, all of those things the, the baseline of the, of the firewall keeps changing. We need to identify when, those, when that baseline changes, and two, diagnose why, in terms of system events, that has changed, whether it is because of new content, whether it is a software upgrade that changed it, whether it was a commit that changed it. All of this thing today is manual and fairly reactive. What we want to do instead starting 8.1, or what we do uh, starting 8.1, is give you a 90-day trended uh, graph of every single thing in terms of the performance of the firewall. So whether you're looking at um, data plane, uh, multiple data plane firewalls, we'll give you data on a per data plane basis. We will trend that data for up to 90 days. Um, logging or CPS or PPS, any of those uh, elements that are, that are of use to us, we will give you information for that. You can also correlate system events, such as content, such as uh, commits, software updates, anything else um, against, against, that, uh, against that trended information. You can compare two firewalls for the same metric. So in case you need to tune your, uh, your, your load balancers, you can compare the same metric for, uh, for, for two separate firewalls. Or you can com uh, figure out the correlation associated between two metrics on the same firewall. Right? So I wanted to see what the throughput looks like against a specific CPS. You can put those two uh, to, together and, and uh, get all of this. The other piece that we will do is actually send you an alert, either through a, as, a, as a system log or on a separate uh, tab over there, to get you information associated with uh, when, the, uh, when, when the firewall is deviating from its baseline. And Today, the baseline is defined by us, which is the seven-day moving average plus one standard deviation, plus or minus one standard deviation. If the sample coming in for that metric is, uh, is, is above or below that standard deviation for, uh, and, and seven-day moving average, I'm going to go ahead and get you a system log, which gives you um, the ability to further forward it on as, as an email or as a, sys, uh, as, as a syslog message or um, as, a, as a trap or you can use HTTP log forwarding to, to actually get uh, uh, trigger an automated response. Two things to remember. One, this data is available for fi firewalls only. Log collectors and Panorama continue using uh, uh, SNMP for right now. And two, by default, we support 8.1 firewalls. If you wanted pre-8.1 firewalls to be supported, there is a script that is published run it on a VM, we will pull the data, and we will push it, down, uh, push it into Panorama, and you can get the same feature set, right? All right, so everything is good now. You're on vacation. Everything is humming along. 
all of a sudden you get a call from, uh, from one of your colleagues that says, hey, one of the firewalls just died. Uh, we ordered an RMA, we got it back. However, how do I put the config on it? So it's, an, it's a classic RMA case. Or your boss says, all right, we're going to update our PA 500s with 820s. Make sure they are up and running by the end of next week. How do you do that? So it is a replacement or an upgrade situation. Right? In either of those two cases, it all boils down to what the local config and the panorama config is. So let's take a look at what the Palo Alto Network's configuration model looks like. Anytime you go to the CLI of the firewall or context switch into the firewall from Panorama, you're going to create what we call local, uh, local configuration. So those could be policies, those could be objects, those could be a whole bunch of things. Um, on a per visas basis, you might end up with uh, certain network and, um, and, and device settings there as well. All of this is local config. Next, we actually push down a whole separate file from Panorama, which covers your device group configuration, your template configuration, across each individual visas, for example. And this together is what we call the total configuration. In, in, in Palo Alto Networks parlance, this is what we call a device state. Every single time that there is a commit, either a push from Panorama or a local commit on the device, Panorama gets a call back for the local configuration changes, and it updates, uh, it updates the device state for every firewall and stores it on its hard drive. What can you do with that device state? So A, if you wanted to RMA a box, all you need to go do is go to the Panorama CLI, do an SCP export, import the device state into the firewall UI, commit on the firewall, go to Panorama CLI again, and say replace, literally replace old serial number with new serial number, and your RMA process is done. Right? All of your device state config, all of, oh, sorry, all of your device group or template configuration, all of those are, are, are sort of updated automatically. Reports are, 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 are updated automatically. Similarly, when you want to do any PA500 replacement of old firewalls with new firewalls, you can still use the same, me same method. There are certain operations uh, that do require us to manage local configuration. One of those is you're sitting in the office one day, somebody comes in, hey, we just acquired a company, they've got three, pan uh, three Palo Alto Networks firewalls. Can you please ma uh, pull their configuration into, uh, in into our panorama? Or I've got this fabulous new configuration that I've created um, in the lab, I need to bring that configuration back into panorama. How do you do that? This is conversion of that blue box in our device uh, config into the green box in our device state, right? That's, that's what we're doing with this. There is a function in Panorama for you to import that configuration in. In certain cases, and this goes back to the beginning of the presentation, you've got managed, uh, managed variations in config, in which case you will have local config on that box, and you want that local config on that box. If that is the uh, situation, you can revert config back and forth, the local config back and forth from within Panorama. This is on the managed devices backup, uh, uh, backups column for every single firewall that you, that you would see. Right? So that's, that's where that is available. Last slide. From a, from a general point of view, I think Panorama is, 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 is is, is relevant in three major areas. One is config management, which we talked about today. Centralized visibility, and centralized visibility is not just for the device monitoring or device aspects of it, but also from a security point of view. I think there is a session uh, later on today about that. And then the third part is how do you simplify your operations from a, from a device management point of view? We talked about that. And that is available across every single type of firewall. So whether it be a data center, 7K, 5200, all the way down to uh, any of the virtualized firewalls that we have, right? And across all locations and use cases. So for the most part, any config that you can see and do from the firewall is available in Panorama. There are a few exceptions. Shared gateways, for example, is one. We do not manage shared gateways, but we are also at the same time do not break shared gateways. I wanted to leave you, uh, we've got two more minutes, and I really wanted to go ahead and thank you for your time today. If there are questions, let me know. I'll be here for a little bit. Uh, how do we end up with questions over here? Do we 
do we just expect you to stand up and shout, or can we pass a mic around, or? Okay. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, there is. So the question was, is there a disadvantage to using shared objects uh, across, across the organization? What is going to happen is, say, for example, you've got a PA200 and a PA5000. Because it is shared config, it is going to be pushed to both. So your object limits on both of them are going to be different. So you might end up with a situation, depending on what the count is that we are looking at, you might end up in a situation where commits might start failing on the 200. Yes, sir? Yep. But you don't need to push down those unused objects to the PA200, right? So you're talking about specifically address, uh, address and service objects, yes. So the question was, uh, but then you have a checkbox in Panorama that says, uh, don't push uh, unused objects. How about security profiles? How about, I mean, there are, there are other objects that we don't uh, care for. And we'll, we'll fix that, but there, 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 is, there is still a gap over there, right? Any other questions? Yes, sir. or pair of Panorama should be managing? So Panorama in 8.1 can operate as either a log collector, a manager only, there's a new mode called management only, or a mixed mode. By default, when we instantiate Panorama, it goes into mixed mode, right? Um, with manager only and with the right resources on the VM, even on a VM, uh, you, can, you can manage up to 1,000 devices. So that's, that's where we are at today. Don't go managing 1,000 devices on NM100, please. Yes? For the ETH variable. Go ahead. All right. For the ETH variable that you were talking about earlier, if you say like ETH1 for the IP address, what other things can you use? Can, so if you have people that have built firewalls and they don't use ETH1 for outside everywhere, can you tag it as an outside interface and then use the, an outside uh, variable? I, I, I could not hear the question. I'm sorry. Check, check, check. All right. Yeah. So the ETH variable you were talking about earlier, can you can you use something other than ETH? Can you tag it as outside or tag it? Oh as yeah, outside? absolutely. Okay. I mean, again, it's 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 a variable that you create, so you can name it whatever you want. You, so long as it begins with a dollar sign, you can do whatever you want, and you can have up to sixty-five thousand variables on uh, in in Panorama. Thousand thousand twenty-four device groups, thousand twenty-four templates. 1,024 template stacks, eight, sta eight templates per stack. Yes? So um, when you were talking about the templates with all the, the template stacks and all the different pieces earlier, um, that works in Panorama 8.1, but do the firewalls also need to be 8.1? No. Okay. Firewalls can be running whatever. Panorama is the one that does the translation. Any more questions? Yeah. Yes, sir? Is there a way to convert shared objects to oh. not being shared? Sorry? Is there a way to convert shared objects to not being shared? Yeah, you can just move them from shared to, uh, to a device group. Shared to device group. So basically, uh, you, would, you would take or select the object and move them down. Yes, sir. Yeah. Firewall pushes or somehow gets transported to Panorama, you said? That so we get a call back. That in. Yeah, we, we get the call back from the firewall that says, hey, this is what changed on my firewall. Not that we do anything with it. We'll show, you, uh, show it to you in preview rules. We'll show it to you on the, uh, on, 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 or, or we'll update our device state with it, but nothing other than that. So you can push that back locally to from Panorama, like you had said previously, correct? We, we can restore that config. Panorama doesn't push that back. It is, it is always stored locally. Any other questions? All right, great. As I mentioned, I'll be down uh, in in the in the booth from from from, from ten thirty onwards. If you have, if you guys have any more questions, all right. Thank you very much for your time this morning.